Pablo, Pablo, Pablo. He's an enduring legend. Even 30 years after his death, he remains the most searched criminal on the internet. Pablo Escobar's legacy extends far beyond the shadows of the underworld. His name and visage join the ranks of pop culture anti-heroes like Tony Montana of Scarface and Vito Corleone, the Godfather. The undisputed king of cocaine constructed an empire adorned with exotic animals, opulent living, and a web of influential contacts spanning the globe. As a Colombian congressman, he cunningly navigated the political landscape, bending the system to the will of his Medellin cartel and evading extradition, a true puppeteer of power. For many Colombians, the mere mention of his name evokes a chilling sense of dread. A man who sowed terror, claimed thousands of lives, and destabilized their homeland like no other figure in history. Yet, across the world, Pablo is idolized as a misguided messiah. The truth is, his drug empire did not die with him. Pablo Escobar, the almighty cocaine cowboy, left a legacy that continues to thrive. In this episode of Illicit Investigations, we take you on a trip to Medellin, Colombia to reveal what happened to Pablo Escobar's drug empire after his death. Who inherited his cocaine production labs? Who took over his drug routes? What happened to his sicarios and the tentacles of his drug organization? The Medellin cartel did not die with Pablo. It transformed into smaller criminal organizations with enormous power, money, and brutality, but with leaders much less visible. Join us on this thrilling journey to the cocaine underworld. Landing in Medellin, Colombia is a truly remarkable experience. The breathtaking landscapes, warm-hearted people, recognition as one of the world's top flower producers, and its role as a hub for innovation and entrepreneurship in Latin America all contribute to the city's distinctive charm. Attracting thousands of digital nomads each year, Medellin is a vibrant and welcoming destination. Medellin has emerged as a global epicenter for fashion and plastic surgery, giving rise to its playful moniker, the Doll Factory. The city streets are a testament to this as they teem with stunningly beautiful women. However, Medellin also bears an infamous mark that many locals detest, the legacy of Pablo Escobar. Each year, tens of thousands of visitors flock to Medellin to learn more about the drug lord's life. Savvy local entrepreneurs have capitalized on this curiosity by offering tours of the most iconic locations associated with Escobar's life, such as La Catedral Prison, the Pablo Escobar neighborhood, and the Monte Sacro Cemetery, where his remains rest. Despite this glorification of Escobar and pop culture, a darker side of his legacy endures in the city's underworld. La Oficina de Envigado, or the Envigado Office, a criminal organization created by Escobar, continues to control drug sales, money laundering, prostitution, and various illegal businesses in Medellin. The Envigado Office has been a prominent cocaine supplier for major Mexican criminal organizations, such as the Zetas and the Sinaloa Cartel, and even for Lebanon's political party and terrorist group Hezbollah. The Chapitos, Sons of Joaquin El Chapo Guzman have also sought refuge in Medellin under the protection of the Envigado office. This organization serves as a stark reminder of Escobar's enduring heritage. In the early 1980s, before gaining notoriety as a drug kingpin, Pablo Escobar was considered a wealthy businessman in his hometown of Medellin. He was often seen in public with a group of bodyguards, but there were no suspicions about the origins of his wealth. Escobar transitioned from being a car thief to a drug lord, but in those years the Colombian government didn't have much information about him. However, the DEA was already monitoring his movements. I was in uh, Colombia from 1983 to about 1986. I was the resident agent in charge of the Medellin office, and when I got there, DEA had very little information on Pablo Escobar, and I was able to develop informants when we were able to identify associates of Pablo Escobar. We were able to identify family members. Pablo Escobar was an avid soccer fan, with Atletico Nacional, Medellin's most popular team, being his favorite. During his time in La Catedral prison, he organized soccer games and received visits from Colombian national team stars such as Rene Higuita. Sometimes I would go to soccer games 
in Medellin, and I would sit, uh, you know, maybe about uh, five feet away from Pablo Escobar. And what I remember about him is he was not ostentatious. He would wear blue jeans, immaculate white tennis shoes, and then uh, a cheap velour shirt that you would find at Walmart. And then members of his security or his sicarios, they looked like a regular gang that you would find anywhere in the United States, in Miami or you know Los Angeles or what have you. Pablo's love for power led him to create an armed wing of the Medellin cartel, which was in charge of recruiting and training hitmen in the impoverished neighborhoods of Medellin, also known as Comunas. The primary objective of this group was to serve as a debt collection agency for Escobar, maintain control of all illegal activities throughout the city, and target police officers and spies during the war against the Colombian government. En Vigado, a municipality adjacent to Medellin where Escobar grew up, was where the organization was formed, leading to its name, the Envigado Office. In Colombian underworld slang, the term oficina or office refers to a small criminal organization dedicated to various illegal activities, such as debt collection, assassination, money laundering, and drug trafficking. However, the Envigado Office has been anything but small. During the manhunt for Pablo Escobar in the early 1990s, the Cali cartel funded a death squad that, along with the Colombian and U.S. authorities, searched for him. This squad, known as Los Pepes, that stands for People Persecuted by Pablo Escobar, was formed by some of Escobar's former friends and allies who became his enemies. Two of them were Carlos and Vicente Castaño Gil, who later created a powerful far-right organization called the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia, or AUC which was supported by the CIA and aimed to battle against the FARC and ELN left-wing guerrilla groups. Along with Diego Murillo Bejarano, also known as Don Berna, a former Medellin cartel member, the Castaño Gil brothers provided intelligence about Escobar's whereabouts to the U.S. government and carried out operations to target his properties, family members, and even killed Pablo's most loyal attorney. When Pablo Escobar died on December 2, 1993, Celebrations erupted not only from the Colombian and U.S. governments, but also from the underworld. The founders of the Cali Cartel, brothers Gilberto and Miguel Rodriguez Orejuela, along with their associate Elmer Pacho Herrera, felt they had won the war against the Medellin Cartel. The Cali Cartel took over some of Escobar's Caribbean air drug routes to the United States. But their most significant achievement was securing an alliance with Escobar's largest cocaine client in Mexico, Amado Carrillo Fuentes also known as the Lord of the Skies, who was the leader of the Juarez Cartel. Carrillo Fuentes had an aircraft fleet working 24-7 to pick up cocaine in Colombia and landed in northern Chihuahua, just a few miles away from Texas. The DEA estimated that until his disappearance on July 4, 1997, Amado Carrillo Fuentes was making $300 million per week in cocaine sales in the United States, making him even richer than Pablo Escobar. Back in Medellin, after Pablo Escobar's death, Don Berna took over the Envigado office. He knew how the underground business operated, as he was the right-hand man of Fernando Galeano, a former associate of Escobar who was brutally assassinated under Pablo's orders in La Catedral prison. In the aftermath of Escobar's fall, more than 100 criminal gangs across Medellin, linked to the Medellin cartel, controlled different areas of the city. Don Berna met with the leaders of these scattered factions, successfully uniting them under the banner of the Envigado office. From 1994 to 2000, under Don Berna's rule, every criminal activity in Medellin had to pay a tax to the Envigado office. This included the earnings from drug shipments, street drug sales, gambling rings, prostitution, and even extortion. To make sure these payments were made, he created a group of his hitmen called La Terraza who were tasked with collecting the money and getting rid of anyone who didn't pay. Don Berna had a close relationship with the Castaño Gil brothers, who at that time were in the Colombian mountains fighting a war against the FARC and ELN guerrillas. Don Berna was strategically used by the CIA to funnel arms and uniforms to the right-wing self-defense forces led by Castaños. In those years, Don Berna also took control of numerous cocaine laboratories that once belonged to the Medellin cartel. His influence grew as he established profitable drug deals with Ismael Elmayo Zambada, the ruthless Beltran Leva brothers, and even the Sicilian Mafia. 
The late 1990s saw Don Berna exercise his power to establish the Cacique Nutibara Bloc, an urban paramilitary group assembled to tackle the growing influence of various left-wing militias in Medellin's impoverished neighborhoods. In the early 2000s, as other violent criminal organizations emerged in Medellin, Don Berna leveraged his connections with political elites and the armed strength of the Cacique Nutibara Bloc to restore order to the city. His mandate was clear. All groups, the Envigado office included, were to keep murders at a minimum. In October 2002, newly elected President Alvaro Uribe ordered a joint military and police operation called Orion in the Comuna 13, one of Medellin's most poverty-stricken and conflict-ridden neighborhoods. With Uribe's blessing, Don Berna's Cacique Nutobara Bloc joined the operation, which ended up with 100 civilians dead and many more missing suspected of being part of the guerrilla militias. In 2003, Don Berna's paramilitary group surrendered to the Colombian government in a peace deal. But two years later, he was arrested for the assassination of a local politician. In 2008, Don Berna found himself extradited to the United States for drug trafficking, where he accepted guilt and now resides in a prison cell until March 2031. After Don Berna was sent to New York, the Envigado office stood strong as Medellin's top criminal group. A new cast of leaders came to the fore, including Erickson Vargas, known as Sebastian, once a trusted hitman for Don Berna. Before Colombian authorities caught up with him in 2012, Sebastian had a big cocaine deal going with Eriberto Lascano Lascano, the former leader of the Zetas, who was killed by the Mexican Navy the same year. After 2012, the Envigado office took on a new shape. Instead of one big group, it became several smaller ones, each controlling their own corner of Medellin's underworld. These groups had a unique way of making decisions. The leaders would gather like a board of directors, deciding on drug deals and how to keep a lid on violence in the city. One of these leaders was Juan Carlos Mesa Vallejo, known as Tom. Living large with top models, fancy homes, flashy cars, and plenty of money and weapons, he was a big voice in the new Envigado office. Tom was caught at his 50th birthday party in December 2017. Among the guests was John Jairo Velasquez, or Popeye, a close friend and former hitman for Pablo Escobar who spent 24 years in a Colombian prison. Mesa Vallejo had connections reaching far beyond Colombia. He was a cocaine supplier to Joaquin El Chapo Guzman's sons and even provided refuge in Medellin to one of them, Alfredo Guzman Salazar, in 2016, after being kidnapped in Puerto Vallarta, Jalisco, with his brother Ivan. Tom also orchestrated significant cocaine deals with international criminal organizations like Lebanon's Hezbollah, Mexico's Cartel de Jalisco Nueva Generación, and the Italian Drangheta. In recent years, several members of the Envigado office have been arrested, and some have been even extradited to the U.S. These individuals include those who once worked closely with Pablo Escobar, as well as a new breed of criminals, the Narco Juniors. These members of the Medellin elite appear to be successful young businessmen, but behind the scenes, they're dangerous criminals. One such individual is Sebastian Murillo, known as Lindolfo, captured in 2018, who was married to a renowned Colombian model. In 2021, Colombia hit a grim milestone, a record cocaine production of 1,400 tons. This achievement, if it can be called that, is largely thanks to the enduring underworld legacy left by Pablo Escobar in terms of production and logistics. In Medellin, while hundreds of thousands of foreigners visit the city every year, not a single dose of a drug is sold, nor is a major cocaine deal struck without the authorization of the Envigado office. This organization, once Pablo Escobar's right hand, still pulls the strings in the city's underworld. This is Illicit Investigations. Subscribe now to our channel to go beyond the headlines.